how's everyone doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live stream and where we talk about photography and I try to answer any questions you have. But today, actually, we have a special guest. Uh, he's been on my channel before. Uh, it's Marco from Hot Hardware and uh, his channel is all about um, PC hardware and, you know, the latest on laptops and everything related to PC components. And it's 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 uh, PCs and and um, you know the computers have been a very integral part of our photography for many years now, ever since we went to digital. And uh, there's always been questions about you know what's the best kind of PC to get for our digital photography. And we did a uh, stream last year and we talked about that, where we talked about some of the hardware requirements <clears throat> that work best with our software, like Lightroom, maybe on Workspace, and and others and. And today, um, I wanted to focus on the monitor, the actual display of how we look at our photos and edit them. And um, it's probably, you know, once we have the hardware kind of out of the way, it's, I would say it's the most important thing for us as photographers to be able to edit our photos and see them and edit them in a way that we can get the kind of look and feel that we want that we can share with the world. And there's a lot of different monitors out there, different technologies. Uh, of course, now there's uh, 4K resolution, there's 5K monitors, and people are talking about 8K. And uh, so I, I, I've been shopping myself on and off for the last couple of years because the monitor I have is, gosh, it's eight or nine years old now. And uh, it's, it's about time to upgrade because the uh, the way we consume media is changing, uh, particularly for video. And that's why I'm shopping. And I figured maybe many of you would be shopping as well and thinking about getting a high quality monitor. So we're gonna look at basically the type of monitor technologies out there, uh, you know, the pros and cons of each type of technology and what's really best for us. And a lot of these are personal decisions, I think, what it'll come down to. But maybe Marco will uh, give us some insight into what really is best uh, because he's also a photographer, an Olympus user. And uh, so he's definitely uh, has the background and experience to give us the best advice, I think. Um, and he's, he's been, you know, this is what he does for a living, right? Is working with computers and technology and being a photographer, I think really gives him an, an insight that's very unique to us and not just the general population that are looking for PCs to watch YouTube, right? So uh, let me go ahead and bring him in and we'll get started. So hopefully I can do this. That's me. And there's Marco. Hey, Marco, how's it going? <laughs> how's it going, Rob? Going, going, going well. Can't complain. Good, good. So I, I did my best to tell, tell people who you are and what you do. But if you could maybe elaborate on that, you tell us who you are and what you do and, and how you can help us today. I, I think you did a, a perfect introduction. I'm just um, I'm just a nerd who loved computers forever. Um, way back in the day, uh, I I really I dove into the PC when 3D graphics were sort of first becoming a thing with Voodoo graphics and things like that and landed a, you know, part time doing it for fun hobby kind of gig on this website called Hot Hardware. Mm -hmm. And my partner and I ended up just growing the site over the years, over the years. You know, now we've been doing it for over two decades. We're one of the last independent uh, PC tech publications in the US. Um, we do millions of page views every month and it, it kind of that avenue of writing about tech and um, just exploring technology has led to me having columns in Forbes. I've written for all of the print magazines that used to exist. Um, you see some of the covers behind me. That's a Wall Street Journal article, a uh, quote behind me where something I wrote was quoted in the Wall Street Journal. So yeah, it's just, I'm, just a, I'm just a PC nerd that happened to land this gig where I get to write about tech and it you know turns into my career. That's awesome. I mean, 20 years. I, so you've, you've seen it all and you, I, you have a, I think a, a sort of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A wisdom about 
technology and computers <laughs> that you get with that kind of experience. Uh, because I, I know over time, there's been a lot of, uh, just like with any industry or consumer product, there's always fads and, and gimmicky things that come across. Like, I think the last thing was, uh, and it may be making a resurgence, but I remember uh, 3D monitors were kind of a fad and people were buying these 3D televisions and, and, uh, and that died off very quickly, I thought. Yeah, uh, I, I was one of them. I, I have a Samsung 3D TV still on my wall that I, I never <laughs> used the 3D part, but mm -hmm. the panel in it was really great. So my older TV looks better than some of the newer ones in the house. But yeah, that's it. Like NVIDIA had that on the PC too. They had their 3D vision glasses and uh, mm. it was cool. But like VR, it just wasn't for some people. You, you'd get motion sickness or you know headaches right. if you did it for too long, stuff like that. Right. And and by resurgence, I mean um, I know my family, not me, but they went to uh, Disneyland where they had these 3D rides mm -hmm. where everything was virtual. But they timed it because they found that people did get that motion sickness beyond 15 minutes. Yeah. So the rides are very specific. So there's anyway. Uh, <laughs> I just want to talk about, you know, you would you would have that kind of insight because you've been doing it so long and you're not going to get wrapped up into uh, the latest fad or the latest, you know, gimmick. You're going to be able to give us sound advice that will work for us for the years to come. And nope, that's so. that's <laughs> that's what I really would like us, you know, to share with the viewers today is when we talk about monitors and using external monitors because our lap a lot of a lot of us live the laptop life and you know the laptop monitors are fairly lackluster for the most part i mean you can get a decent enough hardware to edit your photos and and work with video but then the monitor itself <clears throat> is you know is is substandard for that kind mm -hmm. of work and so i think a lot of us should buy external monitors if we're going to be editing our photos and I think, you know, there's there's so much technology. Like I said, I've been shopping on and off myself for a couple of years. And the two main technologies that I've seen, and there may be more you can help us out here, is the IPS panels and uh, VA panels. And if there's right. anything else out there, or maybe something around the corner, maybe you can fill us in on what, what your opinions are of these kind of panels and what would be the best to get for the long the long game. So there's IPS and VA are the most prominent today um, that are, especially in terms of laptops. So IPS is in, in plane switching technology and VA is a vertical alignment uh, tech. And the, the main differences between those two is um, typically VA panels will have higher contrast straight on. So deeper blacks, um, not necessarily brighter whites, but deeper blacks than traditional IPS. But when viewed off axis, there's lots of color shift. So if, if you were to go at a more extreme angle, um, the colors don't look the same. It gets more washed out. Whereas I, IPS, traditional IPS, because there is a new IPS technology with the monitors in particular you talked about in the last stream coming. But a traditional IPS, they're, they're more color accurate um, and have excellent viewing angles. You can be at a really wide viewing angle and there's much less color shift. Um, but contrast isn't quite as high. And then if you go way back to some of the more inexpensive monitors, there were TN panels, twisted pneumatic panels. Those have kind of gone away. And now we also have OLED is sort of the high end right now uh, in terms of, of contrast ratio and brightness and power. But that has its weaknesses too in terms of burn in. You also talked about that last week. And But in addition to the panel technologies, there's also backlighting tech, you know, um, there's local dimming where instead of the whole screen being lit, you can have targeted areas where the brightness changes and, and that affects uh, effective contrast and lots of other things, especially for movies that have, you know, high dynamic range. And, uh, you know, there's lots of emerging tech, but for the foreseeable future, I think it's going to remain uh, VA and IPS in the mainstream, in the bulk of the market. And then OLED's going to creep in um, a little further as time goes on. Okay. Um, now the, I guess the you know when you say deeper blacks and and uh, contrast, I mean, mm -hmm. how much difference is there really between the two different panels for 
you know, if we're editing a photo, for example, is how, how important do you think contrast is? It's, it's pretty important. So um, I have some data that I can't share directly, but just to give you an example, it, and I'm going to, for all of this that I talk about, I'm talking about a, a monitor that's not using any sort of, you know, dynamic contrast feature that's turned on. Because you might see a monitor that says a million to one contrast, but it's using dynamic contrast. And in practice, most people hate it because your monitor's getting brighter and darker as you're sitting in front of it. And it's very jarring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a typical um, VA monitor, right? So a, a fairly high-end VA monitor um, can do, you know, 2,000 to one. And this is with the, mo the monitors. Um, they were normalized to, to 200 nits. So this is a little brighter than most people would use on their desktop unless they had bright lights in their office. So you can do about a 2,000 to one where a traditional IPS is around 1,000, maybe a little higher to one. So it, it's a significant difference. But again, this is viewing straight on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and um, you know, when, when you say that uh, the viewing angles between the VA and IPS monitor in my mind, I don't think that's quite as critical because usually if you're editing photos, you're sitting right in front of your monitor. You're not like sharing it with other people on your screen. Right. So, um, you know, between a VA panel and IPS panel, I guess there's other things we need to talk about before we kind of make a decision. But I, I want people mm -hmm. to be able to help them make a decision. Uh you know, like there's, there's also, we have to talk about, you know, color reproduction, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of, you know, what, what is a typical color reproduction between the two panels? Are they the same or is one better than the other? So for color accuracy and reproduction, I, IPS is typically better, but just to go back to that main point where if you're editing a photo and you're sitting right in front of it, if you're in a situation where you can remain right in front of a VA panel, it should serve most people well, and they're usually more affordable. But the color shift is fairly significant, even a little bit. So if you had a multi-monitor setup, and perhaps you know two monitors are slightly off kilter, you're never literally just a few degrees. You'll never get perfectly accurate uh, representation of color with a VA mm -hmm. monitor, in my opinion. Having I've tested tons of them. And I'm probably a little um, a little jaded having seen hard data showing this the sharp drop off in, in contrast and color accuracy. But if even just a little bit off, it's not quite accurate. And if you're doing anything color critical if, where people are going to see it and it's not just, you know, hobbyists having fun editing your photos, um, I would I personally wouldn't use a VA panel. I, I would be buying IPS today. You would be buying an IPS or VA? I, I, IPS. No, IPS. I would not buy VA. <clears throat> oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but then, and, so and now get, getting back to your color accuracy point, what you'll mm -hmm. see, this is actually, um, the companies kind of present this data differently too. There's, there's gamut coverage and then there's gamut volume, right? right. That's, that's not exactly the same. So you can have a monitor that let's say, I'm going to just use sRGB as an example. It, it won't do 100% of the sRGB um, gamut coverage, but may have 130% or higher sRGB volume. And that's, you know, because only certain shades, it, it can perhaps exceed the spec, whereas others it can't. So the gamut coverage for professional work is probably the more important number to check out. You want it to make sure you have, you know, higher coverage of a particular uh, gamut than a larger gamut volume because it, it may be you know especially down with with grays right the reason you see oleds and some of these newer ips panels that can do deeper blacks have better gamut coverage is because they can do those darker shades of gray better than mm. other monitors that don't get quite as dark in the blacks i see okay so again we're going back to the contrast uh basically right being able to show those different levels of contrast right. even within the colors right but having you know ha having the ability to get dark deeper grays and darker blacks you know and having it essentially better backlighting tech and and more accuracy it, it does uh, affect the whole the whole gamut but mm -hmm. it's most prominent down in the blacks and those deep grays i see so <clears throat> now, when you say when you talk about the brightness 
or lighting technology. Uh, you talked about the, the two kinds. I guess there's like an edge lit where the LEDs are just on the outside and illuminate the whole thing versus mm -hmm. you have LEDs behind the entire panel. Right. Uh, I guess they call that an array type LED. And you suggested that, you know, you're not going to use the dynamic type of contrast that that a lot of, uh, you know, you see in a lot of specs. But how much difference does that make, do you think, if we're looking at monitors and we see one with like this array type LED or versus just standard, you know, side lit? Um, it depends on how you view it, right? If you were to take an edge lit mainstream affordable IPS panel and sit in a dark room and bring up a black screen, you, you can see the bloom. Oh, sorry about that. I'm out of focus here. You can see the bloom of light coming in from the edges and it may not be perfectly uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the, every panel is slightly different. Whereas with the, an LED array behind the, um, the LCD, you can have more, more uniformity across the panel. But the, the added benefit of that LED array with only some monitors, not every monitor will do this, is the local dimming. So if, you know, something on the left is bright white and something on the right is black, it can it can alter the brightness of just those LEDs. So you get that much better effective contrast there as well. OK, and it'll still be accurate in terms of the image then overall. Yeah, it, okay. it, I mean. It could be more accurate if it's a really high quality. There's also the number of LEDs in the array. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen um, some panels with, I want to say it was over 1,100 LEDs for like really precise local dimming, and whereas wow. some only had you know 144. You know, so it's, it's it's there's nuance in all of this. You know, we should mm -hmm. I, I should put a caveat there too because it's not it's not universal. You might see two panel two monitors that have very similar specs with vastly divergent prices, and it's it's something like that you know, the number of LEDs in the array or, or something else, you know, I see. Okay. Is there like a sweet spot for the number of LEDs in a panel or the more, you the know, better? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because it's not as common to have the local dimming. Um, mm -hmm. so I, yeah, I couldn't give you that off the top of my head. Okay. But so it's not, it's at this point, it's not that important. Probably and, not. But if they have it, the more, the better, I guess. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, because the monitor ultimately can be brighter if you have more more LEDs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. One other thing, I you know, is is uh, so we're we're looking at IPS panels, and you know now now we kind of the because the other thing that comes to mind is okay, we're going to get an IPS panel. Is how big do we need to get? You know, what do you recommend? And the resolution, is there any kind of uh, sweet spot there? Like, because they, they have 1080p, which is I've been using forever. And then there's 1440, and then now there's 4K and 5K. Um, what what do you feel like is ideal for photo editing in terms of size and resolution? This one's going to be really subjective. Um Mm -hmm. For my workflow, I'm sitting in front of a 32 inch panel right now. And to be perfectly honest, for the way I work, it's it's a it's a touch too big if I wanted to use every square inch of it. I know that's going to sound weird, but it's just, you know, I've, I've been using PC since, the, you know, the Commodore 64 days. I, I work off a single monitor right. and I find that I don't use the periphery, the edges as much as I should. So if you're going to work on a single panel, I think it's going to it's going to vary based on your workspace and mm -hmm. and your workflow 30 to 32 i think once you've sat in front of one and used one everything else feels tiny but there's many many fantastic 27 and you know 28 inch displays out there mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it, it's a tough call i it, if you're a multi-monitor user and you're used to, you know, weird configurations, you could probably do whatever because, you know, you're used to that workflow. If you're if you're going to be on a single monitor and that's it, I think you mm -hmm. have to assess your workspace and, and see what's going to fit well. But really that sweet spot where you feel like you have breathing room on your desktop is, is right around 30. Okay. One of my favorite monitors ever, which they don't make anymore, was a, was a, a Dell 30-inch uh, panel. with It had a resolution of 2560 by 1600, so higher than mm -hmm. 1440p, but not quite 4K. And what was great about it is you didn't have to scale windows. Everything at 100% scaling 
wasn't too small. You could still read it. It was a high quality panel. Lots of software looks weird when you have to use the resolution scaling in Windows. It's just, Microsoft has never been able to get it right. Mm -hmm. So those panels just hit that perfect sweet spot where everything just worked and looked good, but they're tough to come by now. Right, because a lot of us work in Lightroom and we have you know our panels on either side and we edit the image in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I would think the bigger the monitor, the more room you have to work with uh, your panels for editing the image, but still have a big enough image. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know, what do you think between like, is, is there a point to go from 1440 to 4K if we're looking at a 30, 32 inch monitor? Oh, so I, yeah, I, I didn't speak resolution. In terms of resolution for photo, now this is uh, strictly for photo video editing stuff because for gaming, I might recommend something else. I, I think you can't have enough resolution. So going mm -hmm. 4K is probably ideal because um, even a 4K monitor with our Olympus cameras, you know, 20 megapixel, you can't see the whole image on a 4K display. 4K is only, you know, 38, 40 pixels by 2160. Right. So you're still scaling your image. So like ideally you'd want enough resolution to see the actual pixels perfectly with no scaling. But mm -hmm. you know, that's you're getting really high end, you know, 5K, 6K, 8K monitors. Then. Right. Right. Yeah, cuz I've I've seen the uh I've seen the prices some of the high end monitors is like, man, yeah. I can pay off my car. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay, so I I feel like um we're leaning towards IPS 4K maybe 32 inch would be based sort of, on discussions you've had i think that's what would work best for you right right um yep and you know and now we're talking <clears throat> because there, there's a huge gap in pricing with that specific spec right you can get down to about a three four hundred dollar monitor with those specs up mm -hmm. to you know five thousand dollars right right and I think the difference that I've seen is in the color reproduction. Now, I, I feel like still 90% of our images, if we just display them online, um, sRGB color space is enough. So I think, I feel like, you know, we need to be able to reproduce 100% sRGB. What do you think about working in on monitors that can reproduce an Adobe RGB color space or, or higher. It depends what you're doing. If you're, if you're going to be working with HDR video, um, and it, the output is not strictly going to be on the web, then having the flexibility and the accuracy for those, you know, uh, larger color gamuts or more advanced gamuts is, is important mm -hmm. for everybody else just doing photos that are going to go online. SRGB is yeah, it's absolutely the most important. That's all you really need to consider. You can get bogged down looking at all those other specs, but if you're not going to be doing any, you know, HDR output for anything other than the web, you might there's zero, very little potential benefit for you to worry about those specs right now. Okay, and and how I mean for the foreseeable future, you think SRGB is going to just going to be the standard for 99 percent of us oh or... yeah yeah absolutely it's not yeah. going to change yeah. okay um and then you know i guess i i'm just going to touch on the video side a little bit because you know most of us most of my viewers the gut feeling i get most of my viewers are just enthusiasts right and they're not looking for uh working professionally and doing things but for those of us that do work professionally uh, and want to think about video work, how important is, do you think HDR going to be, you know, in the future? Because there's so many HDR TVs now, and that's how a lot of people consume their content is through television. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's selling, right, in the consumer market. So I'm thinking as a professional, if I have to produce a deliverable, uh, you know, how, well, what do you think about HDR and color palettes and things like that when it comes to that kind of work? For that kind of work, it's important because you want to be able to see exactly what your output's going to be, right? So you, mm -hmm. you need to be able to reproduce what it's going to look like going out to one of those other displays. So if if you're if you're working on any sort of content where an HDR TV is going to be the main you know source for consumption of that content, then you, you want to be able to work on it as 
it's going to be displayed. So then if, you know, springing for a monitor with, you know, high, high DCI PC3 uh, gamut coverage or Rec 2020 coverage is probably going to be important moving forward. Uh, you know, absolutely. It's, it's even like on Netflix, I think at this point, the majority of the con uh, content may be available in HDR of the new content, not content right. that was transferred over from other media. So yeah, it's, it, it, it really depends on what you're doing. If, if you're if you're a professional and you're creating content that's going to be displayed on on televisions, yeah, you, you want to be able to edit it as it's as it's going to be shown. So it would be important to consider that. Right. So then my next question is: is is should we just be buying TVs now to edit our content, or should we work on a monitor, mm -hmm. you know, a high quality monitor to edit and then? that will translate to a good image on a TV. Um, if, if you're getting one of the newer, you know, say a Samsung, you know, QLED or an, OP, an, an OLED panel and those TVs. So lots of times the TVs have huge input latency, right? So mm. it sometimes feels weird moving your mouse where it doesn't feel quite as responsive or the way the pixels are arranged on the HD TVs, perhaps like really fine details in text. You know, sometimes you have what looks like ghosting where some colors look like they're a little off in text. So it's right. not always a perfect experience, but lots of the higher end displays um, and the newer displays, you can basically shut off all the additional processing. It's, it's usually called game mode on lots of the, the TVs mm. where it shuts off all of the additional processing. And then you can calibrate the TV just like you would any other monitor because it really is just another monitor you're connecting either through hdmi or display port anyway mm -hmm. and once you know in that mode it, it, there's really little difference between a, a pc monitor and a television you could absolutely yeah. get by with a quality tv properly calibrated and and do things that way but then it becomes the the form factors are usually very different the stands are very different it, it becomes sometimes a more of a logistical thing where can I even fit this in my workspace? You know? Right, right. Because they're, you know, this, they're 55 inch, 65 inch monitors yeah. or televisions. And, and then uh, the distance you're sitting from it becomes, you know, a consideration. Because right. you can't have a 50, like right now I can, I could touch my monitor. You're not going to put a 55 inch right in front of your face. Right, right. Because I've seen the smaller, like 43 inch, but that's still pretty sizable. It's pretty big. Uh, uh, television, you know, to work as a monitor, but I didn't think about the, the, the latency or the lag, you know, with your mouse right. movements and the, the, the clarity of the text, uh, that, that you might run into when you're talking about using a TV instead of a dedicated monitor, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have to work with controls and sliders and everything. And if those are a little bit fuzzy, uh, you know, that's going to be a bad experience. So yeah, even, even the slider feeling like it's not attached to your mouse movement, like it, it's, it, it's off putting, mm -hmm. it's not insurmountable, but it's sometimes it's enough to just mar the experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and then, yeah, so that, that would, that would pretty much turn me off as, as an editor of it, whether it's photography or video from using a television because there's you, there's too many workarounds, right? You, mm -hmm. You'd have to put it in game mode, then you have to calibrate it. And then you, there still might be that lag. And um, so ultimately, you're right. I think that televisions are essentially monitors, but the workflow and the workarounds to get it to, you know, to, to as, <laughs> wow, I'm so articulate today. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the workflow, what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's not, it's not just simply plug and play like a monitor would be, a dedicated monitor. Right. Uh, and the workflow experience is much better with a dedicated monitor for photo editing. Yeah, like anything, you the right tool for the right job. You you can shoehorn just about anything and make it work. But right. is it is it the right tool for the job? You know? Right, right. Okay. Um, and you did touch on a couple of a couple of different things. Um, because well, you know, there, there's the monitors are marketed very differently. Uh, you know, some are called gaming monitors, some are called office monitors, some are called studio monitors. And intuitively, you think you could just buy a studio monitor, but those are really expensive. Yeah. Um, what, what are the differences you think, or 
is a really a big difference as as enthusiasts looking just to edit our photos the best that we can. Uh, what do you think? Is there? There's not a huge difference. So the underlying technology is all the same, right? Mm -hmm. On all the monitors, it, it's sort of the feature focus is how a, a particular mm -hmm. monitor gets marketed. What you'll see for most gaming monitors is um, they may perhaps don't care quite as much about color accuracy, but they want brightness and really high refresh rates. Whereas, you know, a studio monitor um, perhaps is going to have really high brightness, a shade, and they're going to tout the color accuracy. And mainstream monitors are trying to sort of do it all. It's going to have a mix of features. Um, you have your choice of panel technology from whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, the mainstream monitors, you'll, you'll typically see 60 hertz, and they don't really care about the high refresh rates. Having used all of them and tested all of them and evaluated all of them, there's merit in lots of that stuff. Like if you, if you sit in, in front of a 280 hertz panel with a really high DPI mouse, the smoothness and the accuracy of mouse movements is noticeably better than the typical 60 hertz monitors we're all really? used to. Really? Wow. Oh, it's it's night and day. And it's like, wow, how smooth your mouse feels and how accurate everything is as you're you know, trying to select a single pixel in Photoshop. It is noticeably better, but you mm -hmm. typically won't find as accurate or uniform a display that can do those super high refresh rates. Now it's all sort of converging as you know, monitor technology is really advancing fairly quickly lately. Um, we went just mm -hmm. a few years ago, everything was 60 Hertz. And now you have 300 Hertz and faster displays now, even in notebooks. Um, so it, it's still rapidly changing and it's eventually probably going to converge onto a single tech at some point. But, you know, most, photographers are probably not going to care about a higher refresh rate. The most mm -hmm. important thing is going to be resolution, uh, color accuracy, brightness, contrast, because okay. that's going to determine, you know, what you're seeing on the screen. Y you can still do all the same things it, you know, it's just creature comforts when you have, you know, higher refresh might be easier on your eyes and you get smoother animations. But does mm -hmm. that affect your work? Probably no, it's not really going to affect the work, you know? Okay. Um, so I, I guess the standard is 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's what I'm, that's, I don't even know what my monitor, I think it's 60 hertz. <laughs> if you but have I, older I didn't, monitors, I didn't even think 60, about the experience. Yeah. Like, it, like you said, using the mouse and, and working with the controls will be a lot smoother with a higher refresh monitor. Mm -hmm. um, that never even occurred to me. <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, if you were to grab a window and drag it across your screen on most 60 hertz panels, it's, it's a little bit jerky and the contents of the window, perhaps it flickers a little where you don't see mm -hmm. it. Whereas on, on the high refresh screens, there's, it's just smooth. Like you just have this smooth uh, graphic moving across your screen. Wow. And again, it's, it doesn't really mean anything in terms of the output, but it does affect the experience, you know, and make I it more, more enjoyable and easier on the eyes. Okay, so all right, I'm I'm getting a better feel for uh, what I think would be the ideal monitor. <laughs> I think you already picked it. The monitor you picked is what I want to buy as soon as I have it. Yeah, device. yeah. I mean, I have one, but I think that's a sixty hertz monitor, right? Yeah, I, I don't like the the high refresh is not a deal breaker for me. It's the the accuracy. It was important for me. Yeah, and yeah. Definitely. Those particular Dell panels, I like the build quality too, and the the right. nice thin the thin bezels and quality stands it's they're they're nice right right well we'll talk about that in a minute um mm -hmm. so we talked about contrast color reproduction refresh rates hdr and a little bit about the color space um srgb and adobe rgb uh, and then for video work we're looking at dcip3 and rec 709 and if you do video work you'll know what those are but um I think really Adobe RGB, that workflow has to be, you know, because it's in our cameras, right? For the JPEGs mm -hmm. anyway. Do we want to work an sRGB JPEG or Adobe RGB JPEG? But I don't think that affects the raw images at all. Right. Uh, because we can just pick what works, color workspace we want to work in when we're using raw images. But um, again, if for the general enthusiast that's just putting their things online, I think 99% of the people are looking at things in sRGB anyway. 
Yeah, it's probably Whether, more than 99%. Yeah, yeah probably. Probably. Um, okay, so I just put together, now the monitor I have in mind for myself, but, you know, I just, now that you're talking about refresh rate, I'm starting to think about, yeah, I want that smooth when, because when you're working with a picture, it's not moving, right? So you don't care mm -hmm. about refresh rate, but I'm just thinking, yeah, maybe 120 Hertz would be nice. You know, you, you might want to go hit, go hit a Best Buy and, and um, experience a, a high refresh panel just to try it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you the research you had already done, it, Rob and I had some email correspondence previously before this, but the, the research you've already done and the one the models that you picked mm -hmm. um, were exactly s sort of what I would pick as well, based on what we do. And um, those extra features may be nice, but again, it doesn't it doesn't affect the output. And right. Right. So it's, 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 it's literally just, um, it's, if you're not gaming, it's just, it's just a nice benefit. Right. So without talking about brands or specific models of monitors, mm -hmm. what would you say would be the minimum specs that people need to look for as an enthusiast photographer for in a monitor? So for, for me, in my opinion, if you, um, you know, if, if you care about accuracy and, and you want your output to, you know, look as you intend it, as you put it out there, you want, in my opinion, you want an IPS panel with, you know, the highest refresh rate available with a contrast ratio. And this is disregarding dynamic contrast ratio, an actual real world contrast ratio above 1000 to one. You'll see somewhat higher on, on the higher end, on the higher end IPS panels with 100% of the, of sRGB coverage. Uh, if, if you have that, you can mm -hmm. produce, you know, perfect images that are uh, representative, uh, exactly a representative of what I'm going to call you guys artists, what the artist wants. You're going to mm -hmm. see it exactly as its output. And the, the, the experience in front of one of those monitors is typically very good. You know, it's, it, the sharpness and the contrast accuracy, the experience using the display will be good, especially if you're coming from a, you know, a, an older monitor that's using something like, you know, a TN panel or a, a yeah. really mainstream VA gaming panel where they're just not very sharp and crisp or, or nice at all. Okay. And then how about in terms of, and again, this is subjective, I guess, but, uh, you know, size and resolution for a monitor. Oh, so just as a minimum, a 20, 28 to 32 inch 4K. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of affordable stuff. It sounds like it's, you know, uh, bank busting, but you can get really nice 28 inch 4K, um, very accurate monitors for a couple hundred bucks. Okay. So just don't even consider 1440 or 1080 at this point. If you do anything else on your pc if you like to game um if your eyesight's not great and you don't want to use resolution scaling maybe you don't want a super high resolution display because mm. that's if you're a mac user it really doesn't matter because apple has sort of perfected the the scaling within applications if you're a windows user as hard as microsoft has tried to make it perfect there's just the the wide range of applications and the way people just design their interfaces. Sometimes you have weirdness if you have to use resolution scaling. So on your 4K display, if running it at 100% scaling is too hard on your eyes because everything is so tiny and you have to turn that up to 150 to get everything, make everything bigger. Sometimes you have weird elements in your, uh, you know, your menus or some things get overlapped that just doesn't look right. And it, that's yeah. super annoying. So it, it's, it really, it, it, there's so much to consider, but typically if your eyesight's good and your workstation is set up like a typical monitor where it's not too far away, 28 to 32 inch 4k is, is for a photographer, I think is the sweet spot. Okay. And, and, um, there was one other spec that I think you might want to consider because we talked about, well, let's, let's. Give me a second. I, I was thinking of it, but then I was listening to you and then I forgot. <laughs> can I can I make one more point while while yes. you're pondering? Go so, ahead. Um, 
the other thing to consider with resolution, and this is typically uh, just just for gaming, but the more pixels on the screen, the higher performance the GPU has to be to put out uh, smooth frame rates for that resolution. Mm -hmm. So you need much more horsepower. So if you do other stuff, especially gaming specifically or anything that does 3D animation, um, mm -hmm. it, you need a more powerful GPU to keep the animation smooth the higher the resolution is. So right. maybe you don't want a 4K display because you, you don't want to spring for a super expensive GPU. Maybe 1440p is the sweet spot. Um, you know, maybe you only care about 1080p, in which case the 1080p panel is fine. There's lots of great 1080p panels, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then I think most of us, you know, let's say we've bought a laptop or a PC in the last five years. Um, are we going to be okay with a 4K monitor? For anything but gaming, yeah, it'll be fine. But okay. most um, pushing smooth frame rates from a game, probably not. I mean, okay. you, you need a fairly high end GPU for right titles to push smooth right. frame rates. But game. I yeah, so but you know, if our if our laptop or computer is four or five years old, you know, it should be able to crank out a four K signal. Oh yeah, at, definitely at sixty hertz. Then sure, yep. Okay, because um. There, there are different kinds of connections too, right? Display port, mm -hmm. HDMI. Um, there used to be what the I don't know, the VG, a wide... VGA, DVI. Yeah, there was yeah, a lot. DVI and all of that. Those are really old. But uh, yeah, between HDMI and Display Port, I mean, does it make any difference as photographers? Uh, no. Okay. Not, not, not today. Like that, the monitor that I was uh, pitching you on that I had here that require display port to do 60 Hertz. That's mm -hmm. a limitation of the monitor, right? So the, um, the input on the monitor requires a feature called multi-stream transport. It's MST. Mm. Whereas it's HDMI port can only, can only handle, I think it's, it might be an HDMI one port. I don't remember, but the amount of data over that port is not enough mm -hmm. to feed 4k 60. Um, yeah. 4k 60. But if you, with display port, you can have two streams over a single display port cable. And that's mm. how this monitor worked. It basically split one half of the screen, uh, the data for one half, the data for the other half, and it just meshes them together. So, but that that's not a consider. I don't want to confuse anybody because all the new monitors don't do that. Uh, all the new monitors you buy today, just a single display port and, or HDMI cable, and they can do uh, 4K60, no problem. They can do more okay. than that usually. So I, either one is fine then. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of different kinds of HDMI cables out there. I mean, they're all there BS because any... it's a digital signal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it yeah, doesn't matter. It's... Just buy. Yeah. The... It's as long as um, it's a digital signal, right? So it either works or it doesn't. It's not like an analog mm -hmm. signal where the longer or crappier the cable, you know, it, it things degrade. HDMI, if you have a, a good connection and it's working, um, okay, you're all set. So just buy the length that you need and the type of material right because some of them have the braided but whatever just buy the length you need right yeah buy a, a high quality cable that's all you but you don't have to go spend 300 on one that has some fancy metal or whatever no as long as it's you know mm -hmm. an ak capable hdmi cable and it has everything you need in there okay so ak capable hdmi just cable. because it, it'll that you know just the future proof right you know it, right um because god willing we'll still be here in eight or nine years when ak is like just on our phones right exactly <laughs> okay oh yeah yeah it was about the 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 one thing you didn't mention you know you talked about ips srgb 100 percent, 28 to 32 inch 4k uh what about brightness See, that, that depends, too, on what you're producing. If you're not producing HDR content, I think most people sitting in front of their display right now, um, let's say they're calibrated and, you know, they're photo enthusiasts, you're probably at about 160 to 200 nits brightness. Because anything else, the, the whites are just too bright. It's just too harsh on your eyes. Um, mm -hmm. So if you if you don't, if that's how you use it and you're not working with HDR content and you don't need to see, you know, the, the, the really bright brights of an HDR 1000 display, um, these displays that do 350 nits or more, 400, 500 nits are probably way more than enough. Um, okay. if you're producing 
HDR content and you're a professional and you need to see the output, you know, as you intend, then pr you probably want to invest in one of the higher end monitors that can do, you know, HDR 1000, right. uh, HDR 400. I, I don't want to say would be the minimum consideration because it's, it's really very bright. Um, when you experience mm -hmm. it, you, you definitely won't be using it at that brightness because it'll sear right. your retinas. Because um, the, the reason I ask is because my Panasonic S5 has some kind of HLG option for your images, mm -hmm. which, you know, I was like, I don't, you know, I didn't understand it, right? I was like, you get a raw image. What else do you need? Why is there HLG? And it does have something to do with producing HDR type images which mm -hmm. I never thought about before, but because um, most monitors I see have like this 250 to 300 kind of nit brightness. Yeah, uh, and it, it's, that, it, that is enough for the vast majority. You know, yeah, it's, it's, and, the, it's the real discerning professional that has to consider the higher end stuff. Right, right. And when I'm, when I'm calibrating my monitor, it, it actually recommends 120 nits so that you oh, can wow. match your prints with what you see on your screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, is is you know basically what I've what I've what I've been taught is, you know, you work it up about 120 nits, if you intend to print. Mm -hmm. And um, but I typically work at about 150 nits on mine. So these these monitors go to 300 nits is is very common. I I I've yet to find a monitor when you buy one that's under 300 nits or under 250. So I think most monitors today are bright enough. Yeah. I, I found that they're not always accurate in um, in the spec. You know, I, I've evaluated monitors and, you know, we we settle on uh, when we're using the color rimmer, you know, a 200 nit uh, brightness just for the testing and the monitors don't hit it. It, it can't hit it, even though it mm. says it can. But um, if you're buying from a reputable, reputable brand, brand mm -hmm. new, <clears throat> usually the spec is fairly accurate within within the ballpark. Right, right. So without talking about specific models of monitors, uh, what brands do you think we can kind of trust if we buy a brand of monitor? Mm -hmm. What do you think if we buy it, we won't be disappointed? Or is that not even possible? No, I think it's possible. I think um, Asus, um, they're all of their pro art stuff. Ooh, my light just changed color temperature. Did my lighting get weird? That was, hold on one second. It literally just changed on its own. Hold on one second. Let's turn Oh, I like back. that. That was you a little mean, too dark. some blue and purple RGB <laughs> lights in the background. Yeah, that was that was weird. Um, so a a Asus makes really nice monitors. Um, Dell, uh, I'm actually pretty partial to Dell. I've had many Dell monitors over the years and uh, Dell's Ultra Sharp, Ultra Sharp series. They're, they're very nice monitors. Um, mm -hmm. LG actually makes the panels for lots of people. So LG, um, their, their higher end stuff, the panels are really good. And Samsung as well. Um, I don't have as much experience with Samsung monitors. The, the, the panels I know are high quality. The mm -hmm. build, perhaps a little plasticky. I don't like the stands quite as much. But I, I, I personally would start looking at, at, at Asus, um, Dell, and LG is would be like my starting point, and then fan out to like HP and Samsung and some okay. of the others. I, I know BenQ gets a lot of street cred with photographers. You know, you're right. I should have mentioned BenQ. And you know who's another one that doesn't get enough credit is AOC. Um, BenQ does make some very good professional monitors. It just it wasn't top of mind because I, I haven't worked as closely with them. Right, right, and AOC because <laughs> I've seen some bargain monitors from like Philips. <laughs> That, that have these really amazing specs, but I'm like, it's a Philips. Don't they make light bulbs or? <laughs> <laughs> See, a lot, lots of times too, they're quoting like a dynamic range and all those, mm -hmm. man, if you experience it and you're sitting in front of a monitor using dynamic contrast and you see your whites, you know, changing brightness as you're working, it is inferior, at least for me, I'm a, it, it drives me insane. I can't work like that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Asus ProArt, Dell yeah. Ultra Sharp, yep, and then LG. Do they have like a line that's you think is? I don't. Little... I don't think they put a, a a branding on it. No. Okay, and then uh, and then just BenQ in general. 
I, I, you ben know, Q, I, I think Ben Q labels them professional. Ben um, Q what Pro. is Ben Q brand? Okay. I should check that out. So those 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 particular ones you feel like will meet everything generally a photographer would need without digging into the specs. Because I, I want to make it yes. simple for those of us that are not like really into looking at every little detail, just say, you know, like I would just say, just buy an Olympus or buy an OM systems, right? <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Or um, so I want to be able to tell people, you know, if you're going to get a monitor, get an Asus Pro Art, a Dell Ultra Sharp, or, mm -hmm. you know, a BenQ Pro, right? And you'll be fine. You don't have right. to overthink it. Just find the size that you want and you're good. Yeah. I, I was just looking at the BenQ site and it's labeled BenQ Professional Monitors. That's so ben as long as you do have just, just check a few specs, right? Check, check that it's, it's, it's IPS. Mm-hmm. Um, check that the contrast ratio, you know, is is at least, you know, a thousand to one. But you'll see the newer IPS black panels are, are two thousand to one IPS uh, black um, IPS panels. And, you know, check that it has the, the features you want in terms of some of them. Some of them are the same panel and you'll see um, a cheaper version. And it's because the stand perhaps doesn't have tilt or swivel adjustment. You know, it's just a, a simple fixed plastic stand. Right. You know, so th there's there's little stuff like that to check for. But yeah, if you're in the professional range with a reputable brand and you're grabbing one of the, um, you know, the professional targeted monitors, mm -hmm. most people are, you're going to be happy I, I, most of the time. Right. Right. OK. And then let me see if I can hit you with this question here mm -hmm. uh, from Lynn. She says, I will be getting into cartoon animation and video editing. Will the specs you mentioned for photographers also work for these technologies? Yeah, you know, the contrast ratio particularly is probably important if you're using line art. You know, you, you want to have those nice crisp lines on everything. So, yes, you'll probably look at the a similar type requirements, you know, a high contrast ratio, uh, accurate colored monitor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I wasn't following the chat either. No, I, I really wasn't either. Uh, but you're just um, so engaging, Rob. I couldn't look at the chat. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. But if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll start looking now, looking for the questions while I continue the conversation with uh, with uh, Marco. So let's let's talk about a budget monitor. Say, and by budget, I mean less than five hundred dollars, which mm -hmm. is still a chunk of change, right? But yeah, if you're not going to spend you know, in that range, 500 or less, I think, you know, you're better off just staying with the, you're getting basically the same thing you already have on your laptop or computer, right? If, if your laptop, it depends, you know, I know lots of people shop for laptops by, you know, going to Amazon, typing in, you know, a, a brand and sorting by lowest price. So if you bought the, the cheapest laptop you could find that had, you know, some basic processor and memory specs you wanted, you might've got a really crappy panel in that, in right. that, that laptop. Um, so even a, a, a mainstream $200, under $200 IPS panel might be a huge upgrade to that particular laptop. But in, in preparation for coming on, I was just shopping around seeing, you know, what, what kind of deals were out there on some of the better brands. And you could find uh, LG 27 and 28 inch IPS panels, um, you know, with 100% sRGB for under 400 right now. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a pretty good buy you know, for under 400 bucks to get a professional monitor, a professional level monitor for that much. Okay. Um, so, so an LG for just under 400 mm -hmm. and 27, and these are 4k monitors. These IPS. were 4k. These were, yeah, it was 4k IPS. Okay. okay. And then, uh, I did see this question come up real quick. Is it, it says I have a 32 inch 4k monitor and want something bigger, like 35 to 37. Sadly, I can't find it. Mm -hmm. Um, they're definitely out there. Uh, definitely check Dell because Dell has flat monitors up to 43 inches and curved monitors to 49 inches. Mm -hmm. um, and all, you know, all high quality pro displays uh, in that size range. And there's others as well. Um, Acer has some really big monitors. I don't have a ton of firsthand experience with them, so I don't want to specifically recommend them. But Acer has some very big monitors. Uh, HP has some big monitors as well. Mm -hmm. 
I don't remember if they had curved. I'd have to check. And uh, Samsung too. Samsung, lots of their large monitors are more uh, more gaming specific. But Samsung makes displays for everybody as well. They make the panels for lots of companies too. So, you know, they they're a real reputable display manufacturer. I think they have um, forty nine inch curved as well. It really okay. that's a huge display. How about and how you about have under to forty inches, that. like thirty eight or? Yeah, they have thirty four inch curved, thirty eight inch curved. Okay. Um, and yeah, they're that, they're they're all out there. That is something I forgot to ask you about: is is curved versus flat? Mm -hmm. uh, RIP. Do they make curved IPS panels or? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So the curved, I the whole the goal with the curved panel, right, is to have the the distance from the pixel to your eye the same as you you know turn and look at the periphery of the monitor, and. You know, it's a little easier on the eyes. Your eyes do less focusing. You perhaps might get less fatigue. Um, you won't have a seam in the middle of your display, you know, versus using, let's say, two flat panels to try to get that same widescreen aspect. But there's a, a slight distortion if you're working straight on because it's not flat, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really personal preference. It's not enough to affect anything or, you know, you're not going to ha not have straight lines in your images because you're monitors curved but it's it's preference i really suggest somebody try them i i did a um a productivity study for a, a monitor manufacturer where we brought in participants to work on an array of different panel sizes and see if there was any particular productivity benefit and this isn't specifically photography related but can you get more work done faster with larger displays two displays a widescreen display and the sweet spot was right around that dual 28 inch to single 32 inch monitor, which is why the meat of the market's right in there. Mm, you know, most people, as you went to the super high wide, you know, widescreen monitors, people, you know, were turning their heads a lot more and the mouse movements having to, to mouse all the way across this huge screen sometimes would slow you down, you know, so there's, but this is really getting into the weeds. You know, this right. was a particular study, but it's stuff to consider. You know, if, if you're working in a Photoshop window at the far left of a 49 inch curved panel and you have to go click something, you know, on the far right, <laughs> it's, that's a lot of mouse movement. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. OK, how about uh, is the second graphic card just for gaming? Um, I don't think you need a second graphics card. You know, you just one one all the today's graphics cards, just one of them is enough to power you know, minimum of three, three displays. And some of them will do six from a single graphics card. So okay. I don't think you need a second one. So if you have one now oh, that's low graphics, quality, you can okay, replace sorry, it. I, I misread the question. So two graphics cards, traditionally, um, if you're not doing a ton of displays, was just for gaming. There were technologies called SLI and Crossfire where two graphics cards worked in tandem to share the, uh, the workload to pump mm -hmm. out frames faster. And that's really not used much anymore because with DirectX 12 and newer gaming APIs, it's a lot harder to, to spread the workload. So it's really, it's much more uncommon now. What you're seeing now and what the rumors are for next gen graphics cards are really high powered cards. So there's rumors of 700 watt GPUs coming next generation. So it is, it's, it's, it's instead of having two, you know, um, two 300 watt GPUs, you'll have a single 700 watt. And, and then all of the difficulties mm. with the software of managing two the GPUs goes away. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, I remember the old SLI thing where you buy two of the same card and yeah. cable them together. <laughs> yep. Yeah, those, those, uh, how about the, this is, I guess, along the productivity type question, you know, are LED backlights hurting our eyes even when shielded or should I say filtered? Depends who you ask. It's not the LEDs um, by themselves. It's the blue light. Um, the, it's the blue light that uh, can throw off your circadian rhythm. And, you know, the, the they can get really bright and focus brightness, which is, you know, hard on your eyes. Lots of the newer uh, displays especially have something called eye safe or low blue light tech built in. Mm -hmm. And previously... This used to stink, right? You would turn on the low blue light feature and everything looked yellow or kind of mm. rusty because uh, the accuracy of the display kind of went out of whack as it pumped up greens and yellows. 
But the the current gen, if you're shopping today and you see a monitor with uh, hardware, like built in hardware, low blue light, um, it, it protects you from the blue light and, and you're all good. And also modern LEDs versus, you know, CRTs from way back where you're getting blasted with radiation. It's not the same. There's no cathode ray tube shooting electrons at a display. It's it's a liquid crystal that's getting brighter or darker with just an LED bulb behind it. So that that radiation is is not a consideration, um, not the same type, at, at least as it was way back in the day. Mm, OK. Um, yeah, I remember working on those uh, CRTs. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What's this one says you you read monitor reviews common complaints about hotspots and dead pixels are monitor manufacturing sta standards up to scratch. Um, most of the professional panels those companies will have a uh, some sort of of dead pixel policy I know Asus and Dell have like zero dead pixel policies and I found in testing lots of uh, higher end pro displays the vast majority have no dead pixels. That said, it happens. I mean, you, there's millions of pixels on the dis display and some of them will get stuck or be dead. I think um, it, it, as, is, as it is with any industry, as you work up and down the stack, the problem's bigger or smaller. A mainstream, basic, affordable display, you're probably more likely to have a stuck or dead pixel versus a professional monitor that's gone through much more QA that's designed for you know long-term professional use it's it's less likely to happen it can happen it's just less likely on on the higher end displays right right and then you know check the warranty right if there's a dead pixel right. mm -hmm. they'll replace it is what right as soon as you get your monitor like f for me I, I don't know if i have a, a little ocd or what if i see a stuck pixel i can't use the monitor anymore I, my eyes just <laughs> they go right to it it drives me insane right. so as soon as you get your monitor bring up a fully white screen bring up a fully black screen you know bring up a fully red screen and if something looks off exchange it oh okay so don't just pull up a black screen and look for a white pixel pull up each individual color Right, because you'll see some, like I, I've seen panels where it's only certain colors that don't display right. Mm. So, w you know, it might look fine with white or blue, but red is stuck. You know, like it, I've seen it all. Okay, that's, I mm. didn't think about that. I would, when mm. I think about dead pixels, I think about like white, a white speck somewhere, but it could be yeah. a specific color. Yeah, I've seen some where it's, it's stuck white, stuck black, stuck red. It, it could and, and if mm. it's stuck red, you won't see it if you're if it's in a red, you know, picture. Right, so. right. Okay. Um, that's why Deadpool wears a red suit, right? Right. You don't see the blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is there any benefit? And we touched on this earlier, but maybe you can elaborate. Is there any benefit from just using a high end TV and using it as a monitor? Um, only only the size. Um, or you, you, if, if you're buying a high-end TV that's capable of the really high, high dynamic range and has that super high brightness capability, uh, perhaps. But it's, it's inherently it's the same type of panel technology usually. Mm -hmm. So no. Um, and there's other caveats too, as we mentioned earlier about potential latency and, and the stand and things like that. Right. I, I but the, you know, I do know lots of professionals that use TVs though. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so Lynn again says, I'm thinking of buying a laptop for travel purposes, but want a larger monitor for editing. Do I need special ports on my laptop or any other technical tablets for this work? If you're buying new today, it should have everything you need. Um, because you can even over USB-C, uh, it, so if you're buying an Intel based notebook or an Apple notebook that has Thunderbolt and has the USB-C connectors, Thunderbolt can can transfer DisplayPort data, USB data and everything over a single cable. If you're buying an AMD notebook where, you know, they haven't necessarily uh, latched on to some of the standards that Intel has set um, and it has a, a, a DisplayPort or HDMI output, that's the same thing as any other graphics card would have. So you, you'll be fine. Yeah, you can get okay. by with anything. And how about like the Apple M1? Is that because you mentioned Intel AMD? M1 is kind of, does that make well, any the, difference? Apple and Intel collaborated on the Thunderbolt spec. So, oh, so the they M1's. both use Thunderbolt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Because, yeah, so Thunderbolt basically you can 
because I have a tablet that connects directly through USB-C and doesn't need any separate power supply. Yep. Uh, meaning a tablet display, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I had to be very conscious of the display port that the USB-C port could actually generate a uh, signal for a display. Right. I, I bought so an AMD, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's most, most laptop manufacturers are considering that and the, uh, and the USB-C ports, they, they have the necessary uh, power and signaling for that. So you should be okay. Right. Right. Okay. And it, and if you get Thunderbolt, you're, then you're, you're, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's just with the AMDs, you have to be very conscious that the USB-C port can generate a 4k signal for display. If, Right, if you're going to use USB-C, because most uh, most of the monitors will, uh, most of the laptops are going to have a, a dedicated display out as well, though. Right, right. Because um, I, you know, the, I've seen these like uh, these monitors. They come like in a, I don't know, just like a mini suitcase, but you attach it to the back of your laptop, and then these two fold screen out. You know, these two screens right. fold out, so now you got three screens. But it yep. only works through the USB C port. Yeah, th those those are it, not necessarily just USB C. It, it sometimes they'll have two cables, USB for power mm -hmm. and a display cable, uh, or or you can mix them. Like there's some flexibility because right. of Thunderbolt and USB C having the display capability. But some of them will will use two cables because the USB is just power. So you have to check that out as you're shopping for something. Have you like seen that. laptops without an HDMI port, like a high-end laptop, or um, not? Yeah. Some of them that are super thin and light that don't have a ton of ports um, mm. may come with a dongle that plugs into the USB-C. I see. Um, but anything somewhat mainstream and not super thin and light is probably going to have it. Okay. Okay. I, I thought so, but I just you know I'm not. I, I haven't bought a laptop in two years, and that's like you mm -hmm. know a lifetime in PC world, right? <laughs> yep. Let me uh, just see something. I have a, a really tiny machine right next to me. Let me see if this has some. So this guy, yeah, like even like this super thin laptop has a full size HDMI port on it. Yeah. You know? Okay. And then one last thing, I guess John is asking about a minimum GPU. I guess that. That comes in two forms, right? The one built into the chip and then a separate dedicated GPU. Yeah, e even the um, the lowest performance integrated graphics that's built into today's processors is enough for 2D display um, mm -hmm. up to, you know, even the integrated GPUs can do multiple 4K 60 monitors. So for, for the kind of, for photography work, for just displaying everything, there's, you really don't, there's no minimum spec. The integrated GPU is going to work. That said, I'm going to, I'll use OM Workspace as an example, right? For OM Workspace, you need an NVIDIA GeForce um, with, I believe it's for at least four gigs of RAM and one of the modern GPUs to use the AI noise processing. Right. And there's some filters and some, um, not filters, what's the word I'm looking for? Some of the tools in Photoshop are GPU accelerated. And then, you know, the higher end the GPU, the faster that stuff's accelerated. Right. Those um, neural filters, they call it, I think. Yeah. So like you, you can, there's nuance in there. And if you're using some of these tools, the more powerful GPU with, you know, more VRAM is better. But just for doing photo work, the integrated GPU is fine. Okay. And, and, and it doesn't, the GPU doesn't play really any role anymore in the colors you see or... Um, there's the, the GPU is not going to limit what your monitor is capable of, right? No, not, not, not a modern, not, not anything. Not, not new. a modern. So yeah. you could buy like just a basic core I five laptop off the shelf today with an HDMI mm -hmm. port, and it's going to be able to drive the 4k 28 inch hundred percent sRGB monitor. Right. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to use AMD as an example because Intel's discrete GPUs um, haven't technically launched yet in the U.S. But mm -hmm. the the integrated GPU, like if you were to go shop for a Ryzen 6000 base notebook today that has the integrated Radeon, it's actually the exact same core technology that's on a thousand dollar 
Radeon RX 6000 gaming GPU. It's just mm. the number of cores is shrunk down significantly. But the media engines and the display outputs um, are functionally identical. So pushing the monitors and stuff, there's there's really nothing to consider. Now right. there's nuance there too, because some of the low end GPUs can only do two monitors, but we're you know that that's getting into the weeds as well in terms yeah, of just yeah. displaying the output. It, it's you're fine. Yeah, I'm I'm focused mainly on just one external monitor. Yeah, you know if you if you have a workflow where you need multiple monitors, you're probably not watching my channel. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, that's good. And then okay, so we talked about the LG for under five hundred under four hundred dollars for a good LG monitor. Uh, what do you think about like? And, th and this, this, when I say best value monitor, what I mean is like something you can buy for less than a thousand dollars and to do better, you'd have to spend multiples of that. Mm -hmm. What, what do you um, think is in that range? Uh, th this is exactly what I'm shopping for. Um, today there's the, uh, the mon I'll give you the specific model. It's, it's U32. 23 QE. It's a Dell UltraSharp 32 inch 4K. Right. And this this monitor uses what's called IPS Black technology, and this I this new iteration of IPS can do those deeper blacks. So whereas a, a traditional IPS monitor can do about a thousand to one contrast, these can do real world measured two thousand to one uh, contrast ratios with much deeper blacks below one you know one nit. So like 0.9, what was the 0, 0.094 nits, like was something measured for something like that. Wow. And the, um, the build quality is also really nice on these displays. So you can get them. I think the regular street price or MSRP is like 1150, but I haven't seen them for sale above a thousand since they hit the market. So mm -hmm. that would be my choice. Or there's some uh, really nice uh, Asus Pro Art displays. Forgetting the model, let me. Did I bring it up? Give me one second, Rob. Sure. Let's see here. Which one was this? Yeah, there's a, a third. A, the, the PA three two nine C, the ASUS Pro Art uh, PA three two nine C. It's like a thirteen hundred dollar monitor, but it's a HDR six hundred with um, one hundred percent sRGB, one hundred percent Adobe RGB. I'm forgetting the DCI P three. But that's a really nice display for thirteen hundred bucks. Again, a, thir a thirty-two inch four K. Okay, so let me just type the name of it. You called it the ASUS. Pro yeah, Art? it's ASUS Pro Art, and the specific model is a PA three two nine C. Okay, so I just put that into the comments, mm -hmm. and then the other one was the Dell. The uh, Dell thirty two twenty three QE, right? Right, and there's another one. I think it's. QZ is the same panel, but that mm -hmm. monitor has built-in speakers and a webcam if you want a you know a video conference setup. I see. Oh, that's that one's awesome. a little more expensive though, I think. Right, right. Okay, so those are two good monitors because uh I think really you you'd have to spend quite a bit more to do better than these. And just for the sake of it, for the, the lawyers and doctors out there, uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that money, no object, you know, maybe they shoot with Leica and they want to, they want to, <laughs> you know, their, their lenses cost more than a monitor. Right. But what's a, what's like a very good high end monitor that you could recommend. So the, the Apple, I'm forgetting the specific models. I, 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 again, I'm like Rob, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of Apple, but Apple's high end displays are really nice. If you want to get really nuts, um, th there's another Asus pro art. It's, it's the PA, 32 UCG. It's it's five thousand bucks for a 32 inch 4K, but it's you know true 10 bit, 1600 nits of brightness. You know 98 percent DCI P3. It's it's super high end, super bright, wow. super accurate, and super expensive. <laughs> you know, five thousand bucks. Awesome. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. So, yeah, we'd all like it if you could afford yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, there's a link below for donations. That I'll, I, yeah, I think we money. should all pitch in and get Rob one of those. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> but, um, well, okay. So the kidding a little bit. <laughs> PAG, PA32UCG. Wow. But that's like five grand, right? 
Yeah, can I, I can I share my screen? Will it pop up if I do it? Yeah, yeah, should. Yeah, so let, me, let me hide myself really, here. It's a, it's a gorgeous monitor. Are you guys seeing that? I'm not sure what's showing up on the screen. There it is. Look at that thing. Forty eight ninety nine. Asus, you know, uh, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Rob, I, I don't know if you dropped out and I can't hear you, but um, right now I don't think we're hearing you. So let me stop sharing this. Uh, yeah, I can come in this way. There you go. Okay. Okay. Um, nice. Nice. Look yep. at that. 1600 nits, 120 hertz. Oh, yeah, this is what I wanted. My perfect monitor, 32 inch 4K with 120 hertz. <laughs> that thing is awesome <laughs> nice yeah oh and it comes a little calibration tool too it looks like yep yep all right everyone <laughs> robtrek.com slash support if any of my buddies at asus are watching send rob one of these <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean if if let's see we got 50 people on the stream that's only uh 100 bucks a person Get on that, everybody. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're watching it, you didn't hit like. Hit the like for Rob. Support the channel. He does a lot. Yeah, for that's Rob. that's almost as good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what does Calman ready mean? Do you know what that is? Calman. I think that's um that's the display software. For, uh, what is that company? Is that Display Right? Give me one second. Okay. One yeah. second. It would help if I could spell. <clears throat> yeah, Calman is color calibration software from portrait displays. Um, I think some monitors just will, will accept the, the profiles directly and it, it doesn't have to be integrated into your... Um, the uh, GPU drivers on your system. I haven't used it, so I might not be explaining that properly, but there's some monitors that, you know, when you use, like if you wanted to calibrate your TV, right? And you're not using a PC to push it, you got to do that manually, like adjust all the colors individually, but on a PC, mm -hmm. the calibration is a little software profile and it just changes the gamma and the colors and brightness through the GPU that's getting pumped out to display. I think the Calman ready monitors, um, the portrait display software can just put the, the profile right into the monitor. Ah, okay. Interesting. I think though, don't quote me. Right. Don't quote me. That's, that's what Casey always says. <laughs> don't quote me on that. Yeah. And, and this is good. This is, this is good content. You know? <laughs> 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 right, right. Oh my God, he, his ears must be burning every time my stream comes on. <laughs> okay, well, any other questions? Um, <laughs> Roberto wants you to come on every week. <laughs> you know, I try to come into the chat all the time. You know, I should say if anyone has a tech question or you're about to buy some tech and you're not sure, just shoot me an email. It's it's marco at hothardware.com. Some of the right. guys from the stream have actually reached out in the past. So just Google me. It's marco at hothardware. If you have a tech question, just shoot it over. I'm, I'm here to help. It's what I do all day. Okay. So I just put it in the, the comment section, marco at hothardware.com. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, no problem. And I know he's been very helpful because uh, there's uh, a couple of my viewers have told me they've reached out to you and you helped them out a lot, gave them a good deal. And because uh, you, you'll build a system for them if they want it, right? If I have the time and the, the, the yeah, and, and um, you know, what's yeah, it's not your main deal, right? Things. You don't build systems, right. but. Yep. It's my favorite thing to do. I love to do it. So when if really? it works out at that particular moment, I, yeah, that's it's so fun. Um, oh. But you'd have, you should you know, do a live stream where you build a PC. <laughs> I, there's a few videos on my channel where I've built some, some really nice PCs. I'm going to try to do one soon for a really high end, uh, AMD Threadripper build. I'm just trying to, uh, trying to catch up on a backlog of work. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if there's no other questions, I'll, I'll give, I'll give 30 seconds for any new questions to pop up, but that's, uh, I definitely learned a few new things that I didn't even consider before uh, I had you on, and I thought I had it down. Ultimately, I think I got the right, picked the right monitor. I'm, uh, for me, I'm, and for you, it sounds like it's going to be the Dell 
uh, U3223QE, yeah, which is you know a 32 inch 4K panel, 100% sRGB, but in particular because of the high contrast ratio, uh, makes this monitor a little more special than other monitors out there. Yep. Um, because at 900 bucks, you can find a lot of monitors that'll do 100% sRGB. Right. But this is the only one that I know of that does 2000 to one. And um, with, with, with IPS. So you get the with good IPS viewing too. Yeah. Right. And um, I, I remember mentioning a couple of weeks ago something about. Uh, yeah, I saw it from Linus, something about this new monitor technology that just blew away OLED. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, blew away OLED. Um, not off the top of my head. Um, OLED is freaking gorgeous, you know, when you're uh, experiencing that. I I'm not sure exactly what he was pitching because OLED, mm -hmm. um, AMOLED, OLED, and the, the QLED, you know, the quantum dot stuff, that's kind of the pinnacle right now of what you can buy. If there's something coming that blows mm -hmm. it out of the water, I'm not aware of it off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, this but, was a know. video I saw months ago that okay. he was invited to look at some Samsung monitor that had some new tech that was like better than OLED. And huh. he said he could see the difference. Oh, wait a minute. What was this? Yes. So OLED is, um, you know, each individual pixel can be can be lit a certain way. Um so you can get perfect black, like you can have zero black because there's no backlighting bleeding through. There's a new transistor tech, so not an LED, a new transistor tech that basically works similarly where each individual pixel can be lit. Um, I'm forgetting the details. I'm totally going to explain this wrong. But the only that it's superior brightness, accuracy, contrast, and everything, the thing holding it up is it can't be manufactured in a way that makes it suitable to the market. And it's mm -hmm. a certain type of um, uh, photoactive transistor. Yeah, mm. um, there's potential for that in the future, but it, you can't mass market it yet. It's just too okay. expensive to build. Right, right. And then uh, David Crooks asking about the $500 monitor. I think mm -hmm. we talked about an LG. Did you have a specific yeah. model number for that um, one? I can, I, can, I can get it. Yeah, give me one second. Okay. Um, It was it is the give me one second while I scroll and find the right one. So you will find so th this one it the regular price is six hundred bucks, but I've routinely found it other four uh, under four hundred. It's the twenty seven. UL850. Okay. So I just put that in the comments section. This is around 400 or less typically. And this is the if, best if, monitor. If it's, yeah. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a good value for the features. And mm -hmm. if you if you see it above 500, just wait because it, it literally goes on sale all the time. I think last night I even clicked the link for it that it was listed at 496. And when I clicked it, it was like 397 of the, uh, if wow. I added it to the cart. Yeah, so shop around for that guy. Okay, and also ch and also check. You know, uh, Dell's got um, some twenty eight inch USB C ready monitors in that same price range that are also very nice. I'm, I just I don't remember the specific models. Okay, Dell what ready? Uh, they're they're four K USB C ready monitors. So if you oh. wanted to power them off a single cable, you could do it. Okay. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> Lascivus missed the answer. I guess we can just say very quickly the, the about the dead pixels and hot spots and manufacturing. Uh, yeah, so a, as we mentioned back then, some of the monitor manufacturers, uh, I know for Asus and Dell, if you're buying a professional monitor, they have a zero dead pixel policy. Samsung may even have one as well. But it, it, like anything, as you go to the higher end pro displays, you're less likely to have issues with dead or stuck pixels, whereas the more mainstream you know, value oriented monitors, you're more likely to have that happen. But it's it's not a, a, a really bad widespread issue, at least, you know, I have in front of me now, one, two, three, five, 
plus how many notebooks. I have one monitor here with one stuck pixel. So mm -hmm. it's it's not super widespread. Right. And then if you want to test for it, to test for each color, right? Red, green, and blue. Right. Yeah, I bring up a white screen, a black screen, yeah, and, and red, green, and blue screens just to make sure, you know, solid colors. And you'll be able to pick out any dead or stuck pixels. Right, right. That's something I definitely never even thought about. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good question about monitor hoods. Do you think it's worth getting one? It depends on your work environment. If you have lots of bright overhead lights that need to be on, yes um because it'll you know it'll block all of that the, the glaring and the color shift that happens when a light is hitting the monitor directly right. um, but other than that it's if if you can manage the lighting in your space then it's it's just a nice thing to have you don't it's not a necessity right right yeah it's just like a lens hood right <laughs> exactly yep same same idea mm -hmm. all right well marco um for those, thanks, thanks for coming on. And let me just give you a quick plug for your channel. Uh, there's <laughs> a link you. below to his his YouTube channel and his partners, Hot Hardware. And he also has a website, hothardware.com, that you should check out if you want to learn more about PCs and monitors and everything else that's uh, in that world. They've been doing it forever, so you can trust him to give you, you know, sound advice and, and um, you know, credible reviews, right? Uh, because there's so many reviews out there that I think are just, they're so biased, you know, they get these things and you've been doing this long enough. Like I said, you have a certain wisdom now that when something comes to your table that you're going to review or discuss, I think that um, we can trust what you and your partner have to say about that equipment or gear. So definitely check that out. And um, thanks again for coming on. Any last words for our audience? No, I just, I, 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 I'm here as often as I can. I just want to thank you for having me on and thank you for like, I, I literally learn something from you every week. So I appreciate that. And um, if you're interested in what an amateur can do with video on the OM1, my most recent video on, uh, on our channel at Hot Hardware, I shot it all on my OM1. I think it came out pretty good for a guy that's, that's not great at shooting video yet. Um, but oh. yeah, you know, I thank you for having me on. I appreciate it, guys. I appreciate you guys listening to us get uh, really nerdy for a bit. And if you have anything tech related, that's, um, you know, I there's only a certain amount of content I can produce, but I'm deeply entrenched in, you know, mobile, laptops, desktop, gaming, you name it. So if, if I can ever help anybody with a tech question, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here. Awesome. Awesome. And again, I did put your email in the comment section, uh, Marco at hothardware.com. And of course, you can always go to his channel and leave a comment on a video. And I definitely will check out your uh, recent video that you used the OM1. So your, the last yeah. video you published? Yeah. So it's a video showing off a, a $4,000 system that we gave away. <laughs> oh, I did watch yeah. a little bit of that. I was like, damn, yeah. somebody already won it though, right? <laughs> yeah. I just dropped it off at FedEx yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you one more quick question just for me. Sure. And I guess for others that might be interested, uh, when we're working with Lightroom and, well, let's just say Lightroom or Capture One, something other than Workspace, uh, is there any difference between using NVIDIA versus a Radeon type graphics card? Usually no, but it depends on some of the software. So for, for Lightroom and some of the Adobe software, NVIDIA does work more closely I don't want to say the wrong thing. NVIDIA is more engaged with Adobe and has some additional acceleration that AMD does not, uh, especially with Premiere. I'm not specifically sure about Lightroom and Photoshop, but I know for like Premiere encoding and some of the um, <clears throat> the workspace acceleration, NVIDIA does work more closely with Adobe than AMD mm -hmm. does. Um, functionally though, if, you're, if your PC is fast and you have plenty of memory and a fast SSD, and a modern processor, you you may not notice it unless you're using really specific features. Yeah, I, that's the feeling I get because, you know, the 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 video standards and other standards, you know, like H.265 or you know whatever, these are all built into every graphic card or mm -hmm. GPU. So things are optimized yeah. to industry standards, no matter what brand you buy. Am I am I getting that right? Um, the, um, all of the modern GPUs, yeah, they can do H.264 and H.265, uh, 
acceleration in hardware. So they're not, it's not your CPU doing all the work. It's the media engines in, in right. the GPUs doing that. And it's all accelerated in hardware. Yes. And in Intel's next gen graphics cards, you know, right now, AMD and NVIDIA are, are, are it in terms of discrete GPUs. Intel is about to enter the space and they're the first that will also do VC1 um, hardware acceleration. But, um, you know, it's a matter of everybody is starting to adopt that. So it has the capability, but it's not going to be a thing in software right. for a little while. Right. Okay. Very good. All right, Marco. Thanks again for coming on. And for uh, we'll, we'll have you on again soon. I guess uh, Roberto wants to talk about video editing. <laughs> I'm not really a video <laughs> channel, but. Sounds good. I'll um, be here. We can try. We can try. <laughs> okay, everyone. You guys have a great week. Uh, I should be back. Uh, at least by next Sunday, but maybe Thursday, you know, my schedule is a little random and it's always great to have Marco on. You're always, always in the chat section. So look for him there in the, at least in the chat section and, and to all my viewers, including Marco, uh, I do have, I always have a link in the description so that you can join the chat, uh, anytime, just like Marco is today. So everyone's welcome, but okay. We'll see you again. Uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Thanks, thanks for coming in.